company was growing, you had to hire more people, invest in inventory, get more office space. So I always tell people it takes $1.5 million to make a million dollars. Meaning you're always trying to hustle forward to keep up with the growth of your company. You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Michaela Matthews Okome. So let's get started. Hey, hey, guys. Welcome, welcome back to the show. It's Michaela here. And today in the guest chair, we have Christia Donaldson. Christia is the founder and chief executive officer of Thank God It's Natural, aka TGIN, a manufacturer of natural hair and skincare products currently sold in Walmart, Target, Whole Foods, Sally's Beauty, and Walgreens. In her role, she oversees all aspects of day-to-day operations, sales, and strategic partnerships. Prior to starting her own company, Christia represented Fortune 500 companies in complex business transactions involving technology and open source code. Christia earned her AB in economics from Harvard University with high honors and is a graduate of Harvard Law School as well. In 2015, Christia was diagnosed with breast cancer. During her treatment, she learned that having money could make the difference between living and dying when it came to treating this condition. Today, she uses her success in the beauty space to advocate for women experiencing financial difficulties who are undergoing treatment to highlight health disparities due to race and socioeconomic factors and to empower women to listen to their bodies through the TGIN Foundation. Her book, Thank God I'm Natural, The Ultimate Guide to Caring for Natural Hair, is a number one Amazon bestseller. Check that out. And it was also hailed the Natural Hair Bible by Essence Magazine. Christia just recently released her second book called This Is Only a Test, What Breast Cancer Taught Me About Faith, Love, Hair, and Business. In this episode, I really love what Christia had to share about how long she side hustled while holding down her in-house counsel full-time role how she ultimately decided to leave her job to focus on her business full time, how she managed running a business while battling cancer, and so much more. Plus, she breaks down what you really need to consider when managing cash flow. This one has some gems, y'all, so let's get right into it. Welcome to the guest chair, Christia. Thank you so much, Nikayla, for having me today. Thank you for being here. I'm so glad we are able to do this. Now, First things first, you know, you have to give us a peek into your life. Who are you and what was your first experience with side hustling? Awesome. So my name is Christia Donaldson and I'm the owner and founder of a beauty brand called Thank God It's Natural. And I'm originally from Detroit. uh, So shout out to all the Midwesterners. Went to Harvard for college and for law school. After going there for law school, I wound up in corporate America. And that's where I began my side hustle, if you will. All right. So as I was reading more about your background, Christia, I realized that you come from a household. You're fortunate enough to have great examples of hard work and success. Your mother, Marie Farrell Donaldson, was the first Black woman to be certified as a public accountant in the state of Michigan, and that throughout her career, she held several high-level government positions. She ran for public office and was essentially a trailblazer like the ones I love to talk to on this show as a Black working woman in the 70s. So how do you think viewing her drive as a child influenced your own sense of what you could be as a Black woman? That's an amazing question. So it was a good thing and I think a bad thing as well. I think the good was I grew up thinking literally I could be president of the United States, that I could be anything because I think it's implied as a child that you're always, if you kind of follow the right path and do what you're supposed to do in school, that you're going to not to say outdo your parents, but you're going to outdo your parents. For instance, my grandmother was a housewife. She left an amazing legacy of like family and hard work, which, if you will. Then my mom kind of built on everything she learned from my grandma and was like super accomplished. So when I saw that natural progression within our family, I'm like, OK, I got to outdo what my mom did because that's <laughs> just what children do. So that was good growing up thinking that, you know, I could be anything. I could be president of the United States because I literally saw my mom in pictures around the house shaking hands with 
Ronald Reagan and George Bush and being invited to the White House to kind of be a representative of what a working woman was, you know, during this time period and the accomplishments that um, she was being recognized for. But the bad thing was, how would I put this, is that I lost my mom at a very young age and I never learn from her how to take off my cape. Meaning like you grow up with this super accomplished superwoman as your model of what black womanhood should be. And you never saw her rest. You never saw her slow down. And so I did not have that example. And so for a very long time, I just kind of worked, you know, myself into a state of burnout, Um, but never even, I wasn't even conscious enough to know that I was under stress or burning out. And I think a lot of your listeners can probably relate. Like it just becomes the natural hum in our lives. And we're just like, I got to get it done. And so I think that was kind of one of the negative sides of growing up with that, you know, amazing example of a driven woman, especially wow. something I lost at a very young age. Well, wow. thank you for sharing that. I think you're so right in that this concept of self-care is very, very new for our mothers, our grandmothers, because they were in a state many times of just survival, of just wanting to Mm. push their kids and make sure their kids had the best. And we never had a chance to really see what it means to take care of our mental and our Mm -hmm. physical as we are growing. And it's something that I'm learning as well. So thank you for sharing that. Now, I completely can relate. In addition to that, I also relate to you in the sense that we both come from cities where people are often underestimated. Me from the Bronx, you from Detroit. Mm. In fact, in your book, you write, people underestimate Detroit just as they have underestimated me as a Black woman. How did you manage to not feed into that mentality and accept that external belief that others have of you? I think it's one of those things where you just kind of use it to your advantage And it just becomes a surprise factor, if you will. And because you've seen this movie play out with different people over and over again, like I said, you just learn how to work it. And so, you know, as a black woman, no one expects that I've went to Harvard, you know, two times or that I'm running this company. So it's like you underestimate me and I know you underestimate me, but I'm able to create a strategy that lets me build on the fact that you don't know what I'm capable of. And so I think over time, both in corporate America and in business, you just learn to sit back and watch the game, but also play it and hopefully one day master it. So, Christia, you have a storied career thus far, but it clearly involved a deep pivot. And we're going to get into that now. Okay. Um, so before creating TGIN, you went to undergrad at Harvard. You also pursued law school. How, if at all, did your experience at Harvard shape your career aspirations? Oh, my gosh. I tell people it's funny when I was at Harvard, and this was back in the late 90s, early 2000s. So I was there for seven years, from 96 to 2003. So you went straight through. Yeah. Entrepreneurship was for the weirdos who couldn't figure it out. Side hustling was not (laughs) even discussed. Like, literally, like, if you were starting a business, it was because you couldn't get a job at Goldman Sachs. And so literally like the university like forbade us from starting businesses in our student handbook if you did you could be kind of brought up on administrative charges you couldn't use an email address or a mailbox for anything business related so the attitude towards being creative and owning your own destiny was not fair so with that in mind when i was in school at the time i had very limited options i could go be a lawyer, I could be a doctor, or I could go work for like a consulting or firm or an investment bank. And so it it shaped my career aspirations in the sense that it told me that there was a very limited view of success. And this is what successful people did. And so I kind of fell into that belief because I was like, okay, I want to be successful. I've spent a lot of money on this education. I work hard to get here. This is, I guess, these are the boxes I have to check. So you spent a good deal of time in corporate America after law school. In fact, you went to work for one of the top law firms in Chicago, the firm where Michelle Obama met Barack Obama when he interned there for the summer. What were some of the lessons you took away from your experience in big law? Oh, Lord. (laughs) It's awesome because today I can look back on that experience with fondness. But at the time, It was literally, it goes back to a word that you said earlier, survival mode. So, you know, the lessons I think I took away from that experience was, yes, there are going to be some people who make partner at these institutions, 
But for the rest of us, even if we're good or great, we're never going to be good enough. And that has nothing to do with our capabilities. It has to do with the way, you know, the organizations are designed. They're not designed to sponsor minorities. They're not designed to mentor minorities. Law is a practice in order to be really good or even great at it. Someone has to take you under their wing and show you the ropes. And so even though I think I was a good attorney, I could have probably been a great kick ass attorney if someone was willing to really like invest in me. Like I got where I got in my career, thanks to God. And literally like there weren't that many people rooting for me. And so that were that was my key takeaway on a professional front. But looking at that experience, you know, many years later, I appreciate it for teaching me attention to detail. and also just being quick on my feet and having to always know that I had no safety net. So it was like, I had to bring my A game all the time because any day now they could tell me like I was not cutting it. And so I think that is why I've been able to be so successful in business because I lived in perpetual fear of my work not being up to snuff. And how long were you there? And at what point did you start to think about a life outside of law, at least firm life? I think that was after my first year at that first firm. I was in the legal profession from 2003 to 2017. So 14 years and I had three jobs, um, which is pretty, you know, not a lot of jobs for that period of time, the way people were now. But I think it was very clear to me after my first job at the age of 24 that this that this, this system is not designed for me to win. And so immediately after like, you know, my first year review, when they basically told me that I didn't have what it took to be a lawyer at that first law firm, I was like, there's no way I'm going to win at this game by these rules. I have to go literally create my own game if I want to be successful, because I was like, I know I'm smart. I know I'm talented, but I'm never going to make the ROI on my talents in an institution that has a real issue with black excellence. And so it was very clear to me, like year one, that I had to have another plan. And that's that's when the seeds were planted for me to start doing something different. So were the seeds planted for hair at this point? Mm-hmm. Why hair? No. So, yes. Yeah. So basically at that first job, this was before natural was like big on a commercial front, if you will. Like this was 2003. And so I was in the midst of, I was natural, but I had a teeny weeny Afro and I was wearing a wig back then because I had just transitioned in Big Chop. But like, this was before you could walk into an Ulta and buy TGIN or walk into a Target and buy Shea Moisture. Like there was very few products on the shelf for women with textured hair. Like everything was relaxer, relaxer, relaxer. And so I wore a wig thinking, that I needed to look like Claire Huxtable in order to be successful because this was the message pushed on black women in the nineties and the two thousands. Like you got to have a certain way. You got to look a certain way, talk a certain way. And I just felt like something about this was so wrong, especially when it did not play off or pay off. They called it playing the game. Like this is what you have to do to make, you know, white people comfortable with you and give you opportunities and assignments. And after that first year of quote playing the game, I was like, I don't have time for this. And so that was when I realized based on that experience with my own personal issues with hair that there's got to be something to this. I'm not the only one with this issue. I want to explore this a little bit further. So what did that exploration look like? What was your first couple of steps to get started? So my first couple of steps was I was like, I was going to write a little pamphlet because there was this website back then when I was going natural called naturality.com. And it was where you would go to get information about making the transition and caring for your natural hair. But the information was like on all these different message boards. And I was like, it would be great if this was consolidated in a book or like a little pamphlet for women who were just like didn't have the time to sift through, you know, 23 pages to figure out like how to put honey and olive oil into their conditioner type of thing. So I started with that and the research and the writing and all of that, it ended up being a 300 page book. (laughs) I know. Yeah. Literally. I just worked on this thing every Saturday at a coffee shop. I came into work every morning, like at 7am to just put the writing in. 
And it eventually evolved into a 300 page book, which was called Thank God I'm Natural, the ultimate guide for caring for natural hair. And so that was the beginning of TGIN. I never knew that. So what what did you do with the book? What was your plan for TGIN after that? Well, it's funny because sometimes you have to trust your instinct. In the course of writing this book, I felt like I was taking the long route. I felt like, why can't I just jump in and start making products? Like people were passing me up. Like you saw people getting into Target, these big names. You're like, I'm never going to make it because I'm writing this book. This is crazy. But God, God told me, write the book. So I wrote the book and it took me literally all across the country, even to South Africa, um, to different places, just talking to women, getting to know them, being grassroots, shaking their hands, kissing their babies, talking to them about their hair care problems and how my experience lined up with theirs. And eventually these women were like, okay, we're riding with you, Christia, we're the products. And so that was the seed for me to start working on the products is like all of the, you know, women I met along this journey who were like, this book is great. You're an expert in this area. Now where are the products? Yes. And I like that you mentioned that mental gymnastics that we go through when we, we know that we want to do something, but we're like, how, when this so-and-so is already doing it. Do I really need to do another one? Will anyone buy mine? How did you push through that mental gymnastics to finally start researching how to formulate the products and produce them at scale? Okay, so this is going to be a really good answer. So yes, there were, the market was not saturated the way it is today. Mm -hmm. Meaning like back then there were like, you know, some players and then there were like everyone else at the festival, but it was like a handful of players, if you will. And so mentally, I just had to like trust my instincts and just forge ahead. And I knew from talking to God that this was for me. But like they say, I didn't know when it was going to happen or how it was going to happen. I just knew it was going to happen. So I did the research, found a chemist. And, you know, that was the beginning of, you know, the manufacturing process or what have you. But I didn't put all my money in, like, say we launched with five products. I didn't put all my money in to all five products for the manufacturing. I made like three of them by myself myself in my kitchen and the other two, because it was cheaper to make it in my kitchen, like a shampoo and conditioner. And then the other two I outsourced because they were stylers and more complicated. And so that that was kind of how I forged ahead. But while we are on this podcast for all the women who want to get in the natural beauty game, especially the natural hair game, what I want to say is I am not here to discourage anyone from doing that. But The market is truly oversaturated. My advice to you would be to either pursue your passion. If this is what you believe you're supposed to do, talk to God about it. But also think about the picks and shovels of any industry. So when you're thinking about cannabis, you know, the cannabis industry, it's not a race to open the dispensaries. The people who are going to make the most money are the people who are selling the cartridges that people vaporize in. Like, the gold rush. It wasn't always the people who were like digging for gold who won. It was the people selling the picks and shovels for all of the people racing to go create, you know, find their gold. So think about the picks and shovels of the natural hair industry. And then also think about, are there any other industries where you are passionate in that there is a white space? Meaning like, I love beauty. I know a lot of black women love beauty, but guys, I'm letting you know, it's a little oversaturated. It's very hard. You should also give consideration to are there other industries where I'm willing to spend five to 10 years grinding in where there's something where other people can't see that I can see. So that's my advice to women listening to this who have a passion for natural hair and are like in their kitchen right Mm. now. I love, love, love that advice because as someone who loves hair. Like my husband makes fun of me all the time. He's like, when are we hope opening a hair company <laughs> or, or when are we opening a hair business? Because I could talk about hair for hours, but I'm like, literally nothing else is needed. I don't think nothing well, else well, is needed. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. It's like, do we need another curly pudding? Do we right. need another, you know, buttercream? What is needed? And I can't really speak to this because I'm no expert in this. The money is in the contract manufacturer. Mm. Those are the people who, and it doesn't, to be honest, it doesn't take that much money to open up a contract manufacturing facility. I'm not that familiar with it, but those are the people who are killing it because they're basically like, 
oh, all these black women are starting these like, you know, natural hair care brands. Come to me, you know, Mr. I don't I'm not black and make your stuff here. They're doing the picks and shovels. We're 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 mining for gold and they're the ones killing it, killing it. Speaking of killing it and the money, let's talk a little bit about what it requires financially. Now, you are still working in law, so I assume you are pouring a significant amount of your main job money into your side hustle, right? So what did it look like those early years? Were you in the red for your company like tens of thousands of dollars or were you immediately profitable as soon as you put them for sale? How did that work? So it would fluctuate like, I think for the most part, we were profitable, but I wasn't taking a salary and I wasn't really, I did use or cobble together some savings, like maybe like $40,000 to get the company off the ground. But the reason I have to side hustle for so long is because I had to pay myself, pay my, you know, condo bill and, you know, you know, feed myself. But as the company was growing, you had to hire more people, invest in inventory, get more office space. So I always tell people it takes $1.5 million to make a million dollars, meaning you're always trying to hustle forward to keep up with the growth of your company. Even today, even though we're successful and we're like a multi-million dollar brand, there are days where our account can go into the negative, thank God for a line of credit, because we're growing that fast, meaning like You can be making $10 million one year, but like if you get five new accounts, you have to scale up and get the inventory, the people, the storage, all of this, which impacts your bottom line. So it's like, here's a better way of putting it. You can make $10 million, but you may have like $3 million in receivables that are not coming in for 60 to 90 days. So it's like, it's a cash game. So you may be making money on the books, Millions of dollars may be running through your account, but you also have to consider the fact that you have these things called accounts receivables that that are not there the minute you ship. And so I don't think a lot of people understand kind of the financial aspect of how this business works. Yes. Let's Mm -hmm. dig into this. I love that you bring that up because the account receivables will mess some of us up. We, We have to be prepared for that. So how did you... As you were side hustling, start hiring. And what did you hire for first? So what I hired for first was a personal assistant and she was virtual. So she did like if we're talking and I'm going to try to make it practical for the beauty industry, but it can apply to any other business. But in the beauty industry, I have to have, you know, someone to help me with customer orders, someone to upload products to the website, you know, communicating with wholesale accounts. When we got into Target, there was a lot of paperwork. When we get into any retailer, there's a lot of paperwork. So anything that someone could do from home, I hired for that. And then I had to hire people to work in my warehouse to kind of like physically ship out the boxes and make some of the little stuff that we made. So for a very long time, maybe from 2013 to 20. 17, we were like a small team of like four people and maybe like a handful of contractors like that did social, graphic design, what have you. And so that was where we put our money in the very beginning. And like I said, I use my job to pay for me. But in the beginning, the majority of the people I hired for were, like I said, for things that needed to be done um, that could be done remotely, like customer service and this paperwork stuff and the shipping, um, the shipping in our business. And what people will learn is even as your company grows, your biggest expense is going to be, especially in the beauty business, is the cost of making your products. Usually that's 50 percent of your total sales and then your salaries. Those are I wish I knew what the third one was off the top of my head. But like those are the two biggest. It's the cost. If you're if you're making a million dollars a year your cost of making the products is probably going to be between 40 and 50%. So 400 to 500,000. And then salaries is going to be maybe 10 to 20% of that, of that million. So you're looking at a hundred thousand to 200,000 in salaries. And when you hired virtually, for example, for your assistant, was this something you did through like a LinkedIn or were you using a VA service? I use hiremymom.com in the very beginning. And then this was before you had sites like Guru and Upworks and right. things of that nature. So that was kind of my go-to in the very beginning. Probably from Hire My Mom, 
Kristen, Erica R., Karen, and Erica M. So Kristen is my assistant, but she does right now uh, all ordering and purchasing for the company. And she lives in Wisconsin. Karen does all the logistics for our events. So like if we go to something like a beauty con or world natural hair show, she'll get the plane tickets, you know, get the hotel, fill out the paperwork for the booth, order all the trade show materials. Erica M does customer service. And then Erica R provides social support in any capacity that is needed for the marketing team. So that's four people who work virtually for the company that I hired over the probably last five years, but they've been with us, you know, for some time now. Okay. And I want to touch on the accounts receivables, but first let's just talk about how you got into the major retailers and work up to that. So at what stage did you get into major retailers like Target and Ulta? How old was TGIN at that point? So at that point, We had launched in 2013 and we launched in Target in 2015. So we were about two years old. And how we got in is someone approached us. They worked through a distributor. They had approached us and put us in a farm league, um, if you will, to see how we performed. And then gave us the opportunity to be in Target. And so that was how we got into Target. But then from there, this is the beauty business is a very much relationship driven business. And so like you got to go to events, you got to network and all the information is going to be in other people's heads. It's not going to be on Google. Like you can Google like, how did I get into Ulta or how did I get into Sally's? You're not going to find it. You got to go to the <laughs> event. You're, you're not. You got to go to the events and talk to people. And once you go to the events, you'll be like, you'll meet everybody. And the people will be like, oh, that's the buyer for Sally's or that's the buyer for Ulta. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like it's very much a relationship driven business. So Sally's, I met the woman at a breakfast. Um, um, in Vegas. And then Walmart, same thing, Vegas, CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, that's just relationships. And then Ulta, we had reached out to them several years ago. They're based in Chicago. And recently they reached back out to us and they were like, let's do a deal together. And that's how we got into Ulta. And when you say events, these are like major retail conferences that you're referring to? Yeah. So they will be like beauty events. So mm-hmm. like Cosmo Prof is one. It's in Vegas. That's probably the biggest one, Cosmo Prof. And it's just kind of like an industry event where you kind of like know that once you're in the industry, you know, everyone kind of knows each other. So to be honest, I went to Cosmo Prof um, before I was officially in the industry, I think sometime back in 2013. And so I didn't know anyone. But once I got into Target I, and I kept going year after year, I started to know people. So I knew who the players were. I knew what the trade organizations were. Like, you know what I'm saying? So when I when I wasn't in the industry, kind of like when I was just getting, you know, putting my, my toe in the water, I wouldn't have met these people. But once I got in, I got in. Hey guys, it's Nikayla here with a quick word from our sponsor. If you listen to my episode on how to make money podcasting, then you know that I pitched my very first sponsor six months after launching this show. And you know what else I did once I landed the contract? I invoiced them using FreshBooks. FreshBooks made it so simple. That's because FreshBooks invoicing and accounting software is designed specifically for small business owners. It's simple, it's intuitive, and it keeps you organized. FreshBooks lets you create and send professional looking invoices in 30 seconds, and then get them paid two times faster with automated online payments. Plus, you can file expenses even quicker and keep them perfectly organized for tax time. And the best part, FreshBooks grows alongside your business. So you'll always have the tools you need when you need them without ever having to learn how to do accounting. Try it free for 30 days, no catch and no credit card required. Go to freshbooks.com slash side hustle pro and enter Side Hustle Pro in the How Did You Hear About Us section to get started. Again, that's freshbooks.com slash Side Hustle Pro and tell them Side Hustle Pro sent you. Now let's talk about what's it like doing business with them. So let's get into this accounts receivable stuff. So when you are actually in business with these major retailers, then accounts receivables come into play. And for those who don't know, um, the Investopedia breakdown says it this way. So when a company delivers a product or service to its customers, in many instances, those customers do not pay immediately. 
Boy, do I know about that life. <laughs> right? Instead, instead, they might have, for example, a 30 or 60 day period before they're required to pay the invoice for those goods or services. So how do you, Christia, navigate that process? So how I navigate that process is I have a line of credit. Fortunately, I don't have to touch it that often because the way we we ran pretty lean. Like, so we weren't out here. You saw this at the trade show. We weren't spending 50000 on a booth. We were spending like the 5000 My team would beg us. We would be there like, everybody has like these crazy like quadruple <laughs> booths. We're in a 10 by 10. This doesn't make any sense. But the point is, like my cash was good. I was stacking cash. Like I wasn't looking at what other people were doing. And so I think I was able to manage my cash from that perspective. Talking to other people, there are multiple ways to do this. So sometimes people will get in relationships with people. They'll take on investors um, to help manage the cash flow issues because it's going to be an issue. It's going to be an issue for everyone who wants to be in the beauty industry. You do not get to $10 million, $5 million, $1 million, $500,000 without having a cash problem. Cash is an issue every single day. Eat, you know, at 50 million, cash is going to be an issue. Let's be clear. Never is not an issue. So I was able to manage that by running lean and also side hustling. Other people have managed this by taking on investors. Other people have managed this by entering into relationships, maybe with um, where they get paid on the PO up front. And then they give up a greater percentage on the back end when they deliver the goods. So someone may say, you know, they have a partner and they're like, I got this purchase order from X retailer for $100,000. They'll go to their partner who's not an investor. They'll give them the $100,000. And then when that retailer pays them, they they have to give them $100,000 plus like 2% or something like that or whatever they're supposed to do. So there's a lot of ways to do this, but I want everyone to know in the beauty industry, cash will always be an issue. And so you, even if you're not interested in beauty, know that cash is always a problem. Don't look at me on Instagram. (laughs) Cash is going to be a problem. You could be making millions of dollars, but this accounts receivable issue is very challenging and you've got to get ahead of the, the issue. I've also heard you say that fast growth isn't necessarily a good thing. So tell us more about that. Is that in relation to what we were just discussing? Yeah. So the faster you grow, the more cash you need. So like, say we've got, you know, new accounts approaching us every day, right? Like, like, you know, people who want to get into this retail space who traditionally haven't been there before. So these are like crazy good opportunities. So my director of marketing, Carly, is like, We need to take it slow. I'm like, we've always taken it slow. Let's kind of speed up and kind of accommodate, you know, these requests. But in accommodating these requests, you got to stock up on inventory. And that, again, creates a cash issue. Every time you drop a new line, you're talking about a cash issue because you're holding something that may not be moving as fast as your best sellers. And so that, again, is a problem that never goes away. I have spoken to a lot of people in this guest chair, and I don't know if I have ever spoken to someone who side hustled quite as long as you did. There might be few, you know, that I can think of. So how are you managing this at the point you are at? You're in a very rigorous and demanding career field, mm-hmm. and then you're growing this amazing company and it's growing fast. How were you balancing this, juggling it, I should say? Well, I call it time arbitrage. So when I left the law firm in 2006, I got this opportunity to work at Oracle. This was before tech was like working in tech. You know what I'm saying? Same thing before side hustling was side hustling. And I was stepping off the partnership path. And so people looked at me a little bit crazy, if you will, for leaving, you know, this opportunity for partnership for a nine to five job. You know, lawyers, particularly lawyers who go to very good law schools, look down or back then used to look down on the nine to fivers. It was like you couldn't cut it. So anyway, I get this job at Oracle. And the way I managed it was Oracle was one of the few companies. I didn't know any of my friends who had the ability to work from home. So there was this opportunity to work for this company from nine to five. So I was thinking, oh, like, You know, I can work on my business after work when when things let off, because when I was at the law firm, I was working 70, 80 hours a week. So it turns out we get to work from home and our clients are international. So I was able and we worked in CST, meaning Central Standard Time, but the company was headquartered 
in PST in California and Redwood Shores. So all of these factors created an opportunity for me to leverage the freedom and flexibility of working from home, to leverage the fact that I work for global clients. So it's like, hey, I talk to you at seven o'clock at night, but from nine o'clock to one o'clock in the afternoon, I worked on my business. Or, you know, I can work on my business early in the morning because the people in California don't get into work until like, or get started working until like 11 or 12 o'clock Chicago time. So all of those factors worked in my favor. And it was very much a place, an honor system where I had a really great boss where it was like, no news is good news. Meaning like, you just made sure your customers were happy and nobody really cared what you did. Made sure the <laughs> clients were happy. No, there, you know what I'm saying? There was no right. check-in call. There weren't a lot of check-in calls. It was just like, keep people happy and no complaints and just do get your work done. And that was what I did. Yes. Just kind of got my work done. And this raises an important point about side hustling, guys. So for those of us with demanding jobs, the first kind of period is a transition to the right kind of flexible job. Because I remember someone sending me a job description once and I was like, that's great, but the way that I'm working right now and the way I'm able to lay low and still collect a paycheck. <laughs> I'm not trying to move. <laughs> I'm trying to collect this check. Yeah. And, and agree with that. Not only the part of the laying low is doing excellent work. Yes, you excellent can't go out here doing the mediocre low. work no. and you try to side hustle. Because you can't lay low and be mediocre because then right, you're not you laying cannot, low. <laughs> part of the lay low is I'm People killing trust it. You. Yeah. I ain't asking for People no more money. I ain't asking it. for no promotions because I, you know, I would be sometimes kind of salty when someone next to me would get a promotion or whatever, because they were like in the boss's face, right. if you will. But I couldn't afford to do that because I didn't need to disturb what I was doing. Exactly. I had to kind of humble myself and say, kill it. And yes, you may be overlooked or what have you, but I didn't want more responsibility. Yes. You get what I'm saying? Yep. So, but like, you cannot be out here side hustling with the, the C quality work. Right. Like, it has <laughs> to be outstanding so your boss is like I'm not even worried about what right. she's doing right that, that is, is the so key true. that is the key so in summer of 2015 you were diagnosed with cancer and mm -hmm. you know what again resonates with me just in terms of you were 36 I'm turning 36 this year I can't even imagine and I understand you decided with your dad that your diagnosis would be kept between the two of you why do you think you had that initial reaction of wanting to keep it a secret um, because I was new to business and, you know, social media has evolved, if you will. And now we're in the space of everyone being vulnerable. Everyone's like, you know, this happened to me. No, this happened to me. Like that was not where social media was in 2015. 2015 was I'm getting married. Look at my house. Oh my gosh. My baby speaks Mandarin and they're like seven <laughs> months old. Like that's where we were. And so it's not that I played into that, but it was, I didn't want to bring this very dark issue to this community. And I also didn't know how my retail partners would perceive me um, as being like a business risk to my shelf space. So I was like, I got to just kind of keep this business running. Yo, everything's good, y'all. Like I'm out here pretending. I'm at this Target meeting. I'm killing it. I'm crushing. No, I'm actually on the couch. Like, eating applesauce because I just came from chemotherapy. Like, so the point was social media back then, it is still to today, you're cherry picking the aspects of your life you want to show, your highlight reel. And my highlight reel was, I'm out here in these streets working on this business. Like I said, when I was actually like literally on my couch nauseous. Wow. So that was why I didn't want to share it. It was just, it was not the time. And I just, did not feel stable enough in my retail partnerships. Realized I got in Target in March of 2015. I got diagnosed with cancer nine months later. So I was like, this is not the time to be like, hey guys, yeah, breast cancer. You know, it was not that at that time, if you will. How did you process and ultimately come to the decision to take a leave of absence? Well, my mom, the first time she, well, the, when she got cancer, she didn't take a leave of absence. So back to the superwoman syndrome. And my dad was like, you need to take time off from work. You have paid leave, if you will. And so it was really his suggestion to me, if not his decision 
for me. Because when you're going through something like that, you're not thinking clearly. You're not like, you know, am I going to take time? You're, you're just like, it's so much going on. And so that was how the decision was made was my dad was basically like having seen what my mom went through that he was like, this is how we're going to do this. It's like, okay, sounds good to me. So when did you feel strong enough to return to running your business? Were you through chemo at this point? Were you at the ending stages of it? And what changed in your approach to business once you returned? I made the decision to return to my business. Well, I never really left the business. When I made the decision to return was more return to Oracle. So I was resting. I had a great team in place, but like I wasn't like completely gone. But in terms of coming back at 100 percent, it took me a while just mentally to like fully re-engage. Like I'm still in a space where I'm figuring it out on a day-to-day basis because you've gone through something so life-altering that you feel stress contributed to. And so you're still like never fully back to where you were when you were like this like machine. But on a practical level, I think by the beginning of 2017, around April 2017, I had gone back to work at Oracle September 2016. Six months later, I quit my job and I was like, let's go. And even though I was like, let's go, and I was in it, and me and these, I had hired two girls to help me with marketing, and we were doing everything. It was fun. It was still kind of this like, your 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 feet are on the ground, but you didn't know if you if you were if you were stable again or if, if everything was good. So, you know, it's just something you go through every day. You're just kind of like, is it okay for me to like, you know, really go back all the way in? Or do I need to be like on self-care, you know, all the time, 24-7? And walk us through how you made the decision to leave your role at Oracle and finally become, you know, full-time founder and CEO of TGIN. You're like, look, you're the longest person sitting in this chair, 10 years. Okay. It's time to it's time to move on, y'all. <laughs> you're like, you're like, okay, y'all, side hustlers. We don't want you quitting your job after two months, but 10 years is, is a long time. So it's funny. My sister calls me stable Mabel. And I really <laughs> she does. She's like, she's stable Mabel. And I think it was like I was like seeing the growth of the business. Things were, you know growing and it was doing well. It was like kind of running its stuff. So I'm like, why do I give up this good money and these stock options that are worth a lot of money? Because I've been here 11 years. When I'm running my company, I'm doing this work from home thing. It's working for me. But what actually happened is when I had finished my cancer treatment, I was taking this trip to Bali. And the morning I was leaving to go to Bali, I had not gone back to Oracle yet. I checked my Oracle email. One woman had died of breast cancer and one man died on a business trip. And I was like, okay, God, I got the message. It's time to move on. Meaning like it was now or never. It was like, you know what I'm saying? It was like now or never. I'm taking this trip, the gift to myself. When I come back from this trip, I'm going back to work. And in the 10 years of me being there, I had never seen company-wide announcements announcing someone's death. And I'm like, I cannot let this be me. Meaning like I cannot not have given my, my dream the chance to fully birth itself. And then they send in an email about me five years and out from now talking about I'm dead. Hell no. So that was the breaking point for me. That is so real. And I mean, my eyes literally like bugged out of their sockets a little bit when you said that, because it, it that literally was a sign from God. Like, you know, I saw a quote the other day that most of us don't take enough risks in our life. And (laughs) before you know it, it's over. And it's like, you don't get to do this again. And like all those things that you sat and thought about for so long, like you really don't have time to just sit around thinking about it forever. So you might as well do it. You might as well do it. But I like your stable Mabel approach. I, (laughs) I think I'm like, you know, a tenth of that, but (laughs) I do, I do definitely agree with the staying at the side hustle as long as you can. Um, One other thing I wanted to touch on is this statement from your book where you talk about the stress of juggling a full-time job. So speaking of that whole thing of finally making the decision to leave. So you wrote, yet all the tests, treatments, physical pain, and exhaustion that came with battling cancer were far more relaxing than juggling being the CEO of TGIN while also working a full-time job as senior corporate counsel at Oracle, one of the world's largest software companies. So 
Interesting word choice there. Can you tell us more about this passage? So here's where I was coming from with that. So it goes back to what we were talking about, some of the themes in the podcast, survival, Black excellence, like no mediocre. And when you're side hustling, you have to be outstanding. Like it, you have to be outstanding to avoid those conversations, to avoid that scrutiny. So on one hand, you have this, this side hustle that's paying you, that's giving you the stability, but like you have to give it, a, you have to give your job 100%, but then you also have to give this business 100% because if you're starting a business, you can't, you have no reputation. You're building your reputation. You're growing your community. You're, you know, establishing a social following. So you have to give that a hundred percent. And so that was so stressful. So when I had cancer, it was just like, oh my gosh, I get to hear it lay here and just do nothing. Or, you know, I get to give the business 30% and I get to give Oracle 0%. And it was like, I had been giving 200% for so long, for so many years. And here I was at 30% and it felt amazing. Mm. So how do you continue now to overcome the fears that come with growing a business every single day? I know it doesn't go away, you know, from experience. I know that just waking up every morning, not every morning is a morning where you're just stress-free, carefree, like you have knots in your stomach. You're worried about pleasing, um, you know, your, your accounts and making sure everything is fine. How do you manage that? Well, I think several tips, and this is for people who are with companies and the side hustlers. I think one, in the past year, you have to get good at managing your emotions. And what I mean by that is whether it's anger, excitement, side hustling, running a company is an emotional roller coaster. And how you react in your personal life is how you'll react in business. And so what I learned from the stress, you know, of, you know, having been diagnosed with cancer and having had health challenges, you know, during the course of this business is every day in a business, it's like, especially when you have a lot of people and you're growing, it's like, oh my gosh, she's dropping the ball on this today. Oh my gosh, this is happening today. Oh my gosh, we got this email and this is due. Oh my gosh, this retailer, you know, is sending back this many products because they found like X, Y, Z wrong with it or something with the label. And it's up and down all day long all day long. You're in fight or flight mode all the time. And the key is you have to get to a space where you're just like even killed, where it's just like you don't react when people are not living up to expectations. You don't react when you get, you know, a call saying that people have to send back, you know, thousands of products. You don't react when, you know, you you go up just a little bit when you get some good news, but you have to learn to manage your emotions. I think also what has helped has been being in a CEO peer group, I'm in this organization called Vistage, and I meet with CEOs, 10 to 12 people once a month, just to kind of talk about my problems or their problems or whatever. And it just gives you a new and different perspective because being an entrepreneur, being a side hustler is not only hard, but it's extremely lonely. And I think we need that, that social support. But that's how I've kind of managed to make it through. If you had a chance to start your company all over again from scratch, from side hustle to full-time entrepreneur, what do you think you would do differently? I think I would have focused more on product development versus trying to perfect operations. I think we waited too long to start dropping lines. That's really critical when you're trying to grab shelf space in this business. I was more focused on taking an, a, a B plus to an A minus or an A versus focus on just getting on, getting on the shelf planning a flag and expanding, particularly before the market got oversaturated. So that is something I would think I would have done differently. But sometimes when you do it that route, then your operations behind the scenes can be a shit show. I didn't mean to swear on your podcast. Uh, it's <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. This is not a PG podcast, guys. So the, this is just a regular human podcast. <laughs> no, that's fine. So the point is I played the operations game or put my bets on, you know, we're the best shippers. We're going to get it to you on time. We're going to get the paperwork in. The paperwork's going to be right. You know, there's going to be no you know, issues with our labels. And my accountant came in one day. It was this old Jewish man. And he was like, girl, you're playing the wrong game. You're not a shipping company. You're a beauty company. Go put all your <laughs> bets on marketing and product development. He's like, go do that. And so that's what I did. But the point is, I probably should have done that sooner um, because shelf space 
back then was up for grabs and I wasn't grabbing it. I was focused on making sure, you know, my I's were dotted and my T's were crossed because I was very conservative and I came from a background where it was better to just, you know, deliver that A plus quality work. I had, I wasn't a C player. I wasn't used to just doing C work because like you said, when you started hustling, you got to be on the A program. And I just wasn't used to operating, you know, in a, at a C level or a B level. And in some cases, you got to be okay with a B. I love that. I think that raises a really important point because I'm always curious about this. When I walk into a Target and I see the merchandising and I wonder for the Black women and, you know, like yourself that I know are, have started this themselves, they don't, they're not run by a major consumer product goods company who have brand managers to go out and check how their products are being merchandised. How do you deal with that? How do you manage that? Do you have people doing retail checks just to see how you're doing with shelf space and how you're being uh, positioned compared with your competitors? Well, sometimes we know because the planogram is kind of consistent across stores, but we do have, you know, merchandisers that go in. We can't hit up 1,700 doors at Target if you will. But like we have people that will go in in select cities and show us and give us a snapshot of what's going on Got it. in certain stores. But I don't want to make sure we don't miss this for anyone who's trying to do business with national retail. I just want you to be careful. The beauty industry, and I can't speak for other industries, is a lot like the record industry. Back in the day where you had all those people making money, like TLC, MC Hammer, all of that, and then they were bankrupt, like, you know, five years later. In this business, and in a lot of businesses, you're going to have those people who are like, that are the middlemen, the middlemen, and the middlemen, like the pebbles to TLC. You have to be careful about who you partner with. You have to be careful about the contracts you sign. You have to be careful about the number of people that are between you and your money. So sometimes things will be presented to you. They sound like great opportunities. Make sure you have your lawyer look over your paperwork. Make sure you take the chance of reaching out into the industry and say, I don't know you, but I'm about to sign this contract with so-and-so. Can I talk to you. I'm about to sign this paperwork with this retailer in your category. Do you have 10 minutes to talk to me? Like it's too important to let your ego or your feelings or your fears get in the way of making those phone calls. And I wish that was something that I would have done. That is true facts right there. That is so important. I mean, speaking of ego, as someone who is an attorney, did you in the beginning try to do that on your own or did you know that, no, I need a separate, like I need a, my own attorney for this? For the paperwork? Yeah, for like reading over contracts, redlining. I was the fool. I, I, you know, they say an attorney represents themselves as a fool. Well, I'm a fool. Because I, <laughs> <laughs> I've done all my contracts. Um, I don't do my trademarks because I know that's not my wheelhouse. But when I was at Oracle, all I did was negotiations and contracts. And so I'm pretty good. I'm really good at it. Like I kind of can toot my own horn when it comes to contracts. Now, litigation, there are other aspects of the business where I would definitely hire an attorney. Litigation, trademarks, us doing stuff with our not-for-profit. I got to bring attorneys in on that. But like reviewing a basic contract or paperwork, I usually can handle that. That okay. was my expertise. Got it. How fortunate. So <laughs> before we transition to the lightning round, I want to know what is next for Christia and Thank God is Natural. Well, I would say for the company, we're up to some amazing things with our retail partner, Ulta. So stay tuned um, for more information. You can follow us on social for that. But they have been amazing to work with. In terms of our foundation, we're going to continue to raise awareness of the importance of breast cancer um, in women under 40 throughout the Chicagoland area and nationwide. And then finally, with respect to myself, I just dropped a book. This is only a test. What breast cancer taught me about faith, love, hair, and business, which goes over a lot of the topics we've talked about on the podcast in more detail, specifically survival, black excellence, starting and running a business. And like I said, you can get that on Amazon. And so I'll be doing a tour, a book tour this year. So hopefully I'll be in your city. 
All right. That's a lot. (laughs) Now it's time to transition into the lightning round. Are you ready? I'm more than ready. All right. Number one, what is a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? For me, it's having a business coach that I meet with monthly. And I know there are a lot of people out there talking about their like, you know, business coaches, but like I use my coach from Vistage as well as another coach that helps me move more with kind of the personality and the soft side of the business. But just having that person to hold you up accountable, to have you think out loud, to explain the decisions you're making is so critical because as the CEO of your company, you're constantly coaching everyone else and no one is coaching you and you need that outside perspective, but you also need that regular cadence of answering to someone else. And so that for me has been critical. Love it. Number two, what has been the best business book that you personally have consumed? I would say it's the book Essentialism, um, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of that one. That's been one of my favorites. Okay. I actually really like that one as well. Um, Number three, what is a non-negotiable part of your daily routine? No matter what, I don't care how crazy the day is, I got to read my Bible and my daily devotional. Like I can't walk up out the house. You know, that saying new level, new devil is for real. Meaning like the more you grow in your business, like all types of weapons are going to be coming against you. Sometimes in the spirit realm, God is there to protect you, but the devil does not like to see the work you're doing in the community, the work you're doing in your enterprise. And so you have to stay prayed up. It is like essential. Yes, yes, yes. To all of that. And do you have a devotional that you recommend? I I mean, I wish I had a good one, but I listen to Charles Stanley or I go to his um, page, but it's not like, um, it's like I'm getting the word in, but it's not like totally changing my life. Like I need probably a good one. So if anyone is listening to this and has a devotional, DM me, I'm open, but I got to get some type of, I've got to feed myself with some type of word in the morning. Yes. Number four, what is a personal habit that helped you significantly when you were side hustling? Ooh, let's see. I think when I was putting the haters to the side, when you are side hustling and it doesn't matter what industry you're in, if you're in beauty, food, you know, services or whatever, people will always act like you ain't doing nothing and that you ain't going nowhere and that you go fail and what have you. And you have to learn to block those people out and you cannot share your vision with everyone. You just can't, especially people where you know the response you're going to get. You got to just kind of keep your blinders on and just keep your head down and do your work. But just that is going to happen no matter what industry you know there. You're going to find there are a lot of people who don't believe in what you're doing. Mm, Good one. And then finally, number five, what is your parting advice for fellow black women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss, but are worried about losing that steady paycheck? My thing is. You have to know when the time is right for you, both personally and financially. So there are a lot of people out here, these instapreneurs quitting their jobs. (laughs) Instapreneurs. I I mean, people be like, okay, y'all, I'm launching. And I'm like, wait, what? You they was getting they was about to get fired from their job anyway. So it didn't matter. (laughs) But the point is keep your head down and don't look at what people are doing on social media. Have a plan. Get your financial house in order. Make sure your benefits are lined up when you quit your job. Make sure your stock options, you going over that with your financial advisor. And also the one piece of advice I wish someone had given me, and granted, the world is a very different place, is sometimes you can side hustle your way out the job, meaning like it doesn't have to be zero to 100. When I left, my boss was like, you know, if you ever want to come back or work for us on a part time basis, you can do that. Think of about a plan. Sometimes it doesn't have to be, I'm here today, gone tomorrow. Maybe it's, I'm down to three days a week, two days a week, or I only come in as a lawyer during the be- the busy season. So think about that and know that's an option to you for you, especially if you're operating in the spirit of excellence and giving that, you know, that A quality work. 
they're not going to want to lose you. And so they're going to accommodate you however they can. Yes. All right, Christia. So where can people connect with you and TGIN after this episode? So you can find me on Instagram. I'm TGIN CEO. Same for Twitter, Facebook, all of that. And the company, we are on Instagram all the time as well as other channels. But you can find, thank God it's natural at TGI Natural. Or you can go to our website at www.thankgodit'snatural.com. All right. Well, thank you so much for being in the guest chair. I really, really enjoyed having you. Well, I'm glad you did. I had a great time today. These were some awesome questions. Awesome. And there you have it, guys. Hey guys, thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other side hustlers just like you to find the show. And if you want to hear more from me, you can follow me on Instagram at Side Hustle Pro. Plus, sign up for my six bullet Saturday newsletter at sidehustleproco slash newsletter. When you sign up, you will receive weekly nuggets from me, including what I'm up to, personal lessons, and my business tip of the week week. Again, that's sidehustlepro.co slash newsletter to sign up. Talk to you soon.